Let's take our Bibles. First Samuel chapter 1. First Samuel chapter 1. One of the most touching and I think uh, beautiful of all the passages in the Bible. It's interesting between the book of Judges where you have just total bedlam and degradation and some of the worst things going on uh, that a country could face. Civil wars and um, just debauchery uh, that uh, you read in the book of Judges. And then, of course, over in the book of Samuel, we have all the chaos of the kings of Israel going ahead of the Lord Jesus and having Saul first before getting the king that was after God's own heart that he had designed for them to have in the first place. And right in between that, you have a beautiful stories of two women. Of course, you have the story of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer, where we see that uh, she was a Moabite, and yet a woman who said, your God will be my God. We talked about that in Sunday school, how that, uh, how that uh, Israel was to be an oracle to the nations of the grace of God. And we see that she became one of the, she was incorporated into the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then here we have with Hannah, a story of, again, a time in, of the, the end of Judges, the first of, or the end of Judges, now God is going to be changing things. Um, but you'll notice uh, he's, there's going to be the institution of the prophet. It's interesting that God sets up the prophet before he sets up the king. It's always spiritual first and then power second. And we see that um, Samuel is going to become the father or the father of the office of the prophets, the school of the prophets. And from now to the end of the book of, of, uh, of the Old Testament, Malachi, you're going to see the prophets. In fact, Jesus, when he talked about the Old Testament, he didn't say the law and the kings or the law and the history of Israel. But he said the law and the prophets. And so the Bible is basically, the Old Testament is divided up into uh, the law and then the prophets. And of course, uh, it incorporates more than that, the poetry and so forth. But uh, basically, generally, uh, in a general sense, that's what the Lord was saying. Even, prof- even the poetry has uh, prophecy in it. But now we see now in the book of, uh, of First Samuel, that says, Now a certain man from Mammoth Zophim of the mo- mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, or Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tahu, the son of Zaph, an Ephraimite. Now, First Chronicles tells us, and all those chronicles, you can go and, and pick out a lot of these things, but you have to be a technician to do it if you have to really want to get into it. But uh, those who do it say that um, Samuel, or that uh, Elkanah then, was a Levite. He had to be because, of course, we know that uh, that uh, Samuel would offer sacrifices, uh, and it was his office to do so. But uh, also that he was from the sons of Kohath, which was, of course, the three different uh, sons of Levi. And uh, that would make him uh, one of the uh, families that would be the, the, the uh, people who would deal with the um, organization of the uh, of the uh, event, the feasts, and so forth, as well as the singers. And so uh, he was a Kohathite, um, and he, w- he had two wives, and that's the first mark against him. Um, and the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would make offerings, uh, he would give portions to Benina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. 
So it was year by year that when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to Hannah, uh, why do you weep? Uh, why, why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? And now one of the most misogynistic statements in all Scripture. Am I not better to you than ten sons? Uh, Elkanah, you really are, you got problems. <laughs> okay. uh, he says, so Hannah arose after he had finished eating, uh, after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you would indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid and remember me and not forget your your maidservant, or your handmaid, but will give your a maid servant, a male child, uh, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But but Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your handmaiden a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked him. And she said, Let the maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your holy word this morning. Oh, how we pray, Lord, that we would see your great compassion, your great love in overcoming the situations of life. So many times we look at the impossibilities of life. How can you work in this situation? How can you work in this country? How can you work in this family? And Lord, we realize that it's only you that can straighten out. It's only you that can bless. It's only you that can raise up and get us out of the morass of sin. But here, Lord, we see a lady who is a woman after your own heart, a woman who changed the nation because what you produced through her. Oh, Father, we pray that you would raise up godly women, women that uh, stand for you, women that uh, know whom they belong and what uh, they are here for, women who know you and your power in their lives. Oh, Father, bless us as we would look into your word this morning. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, it is has been said that the hand that rocks the cradle uh, rules the world. And if you look through history, you'll see, and why, why do you study? A lot of times as you look, and I remember the history of civilization classes. Why do you study art? And uh, why do you study social norms and dress on and things like that as you would study the wars and uh, the economics of nations and so forth. Because as you look into a nation, whether it's Rome or France or whatever, then you will see that you can tell a lot about society by how society treats its women and how that the women dress, how that the women, uh, how that they conduct themselves. Um, uh, Abigail uh, Adams, whenever she went to uh, France, she was just appalled at the conduct of women. And uh, it was amazing, Abigail uh, being a, from a Christian background and her family was uh, part of the, um, <coughs> the families that had started the Great Awakening. Uh, she went to England 
uh, or went to France and just saw the appalling immorality of the country. And it's, it's interesting that uh, that country fell apart socially uh, within just a few years that she was there. Whereas England and the United States at that time were going through revivals. And it was interesting how that the United States, they've studied this. Why did the United States Revolution turn out so much differently than the French Revolution? And why was one so violent and uh, destroyed a nation, whereas the other one built the nation? And they looked, and of course, they don't want to admit it, but uh, the whole thing had to do with the social fabric. And later on, the French skeptic uh, who really wanted to come and find out himself, a man named de Tocqueville, a French Frenchman, uh, came over and he said, you know, and that famous statement that he said after he'd gone through the, uh, he went out and slept in the log cabins, he went to the industrial cities, he went all over and he said uh, that famous statement, uh, the reason the United States is great is because it's good. And as soon as America, or as soon as the United States quits being good, it will cease being great. He said, if you don't find that goodness uh, on the streets or you find it in his churches. It's interesting how that he started noticing all that. And he put it together, although he, from what I understand, from what I've read about him, he never accepted the Lord as a Savior, yet he saw that objective truth that was so true in the 1800s in the United States. And so we see the social fabric and so many times is so wrapped up in the next generation is in what God does through a family. And one of the things that he found uh, out in the log cabins of Kentucky and Tennessee and Michigan and all the places that were still uncivilized at the time. And he said two, pla- two things he found on the hearth of almost every, every house. And that was a Bible and a copy of, the, of Pilgrim's Progress and how the children learned how to read from Pilgrim's Progress. In fact, if you go back into the uh, and to look at the McGuffey readers. Anybody know what McGuffey readers, those were the primary readers or the primary books that children learned how to read back in the 1800s. And actually it was so scriptural and so much scripture in it in those McGuffey readers that the Catholic Church said, we're going to turn, we got to get our uh, children out of these public schools because we're going to turn them into Protestants. We have to start our parochial schools, and that's the whole reason they started Catholic schools was because the United States was so Protestant in its teaching about uh, biblical truths that they had to that they they started parochial schools to get them out of the so-called Christian schools, which were the public schools. Can you imagine that today? Today, uh, we got a man, a football coach that is, uh, or a sports coach anyway, uh, before the Supreme Court now because simply because he, he prayed before, before a game. Isn't that sad how far we've come? And so we see that the social fabric is so wrapped up in the home and in the family and especially in the mother and, and in it with, the, with the family. Now, here we see that we have a situation where this country was falling apart. We see that uh, there had been civil war. Uh, the whole, uh, uh, one of the tribes of Israel, Benjamin, had nearly been destroyed because of its debauchery and then the civil war that was caused as a result of it. Another tribe, Dan, had gone into abject idolatry and was making tremendous impact on Israel spiritually. Then you had all the divisions within the tribes and you had the gross immorality that was going on and the weak priesthood. And we see that right here uh, with, uh, with the men that are mentioned here. Uh, first of all, Elkanah. He was, as a Levite, commissioned to go three times a year to uh, Shiloh for, for the offerings and so forth. And we notice he's only going once a year. Now the feast that they would go to would be Passover, and then they'd Pentecost, and then the first fruits, or the uh, excuse me, the uh, the, har- the feast of the harvest, and and he would. So there's three times a year that uh, he was supposed to be there to help out, but we notice he's only going once a year. But then, as we notice also, he is conforming to the uh, cultural norms of the day. His wife didn't have children. So why not marry another woman? After all, that's what the Canaanites did. Now, 
and then that throws everything into chaos. You know, when I read about Hannah and Penina, or you read about uh, uh, Leah and Rachel, uh, I would not want to be either one of those women. I don't think any of us would. I mean, I feel sorry for Leah. I feel sorry for Rachel. I feel sorry for Penina. How would you like to be t- told uh, your dad comes home and says, you know, uh, this uh, well-to-do guy, he uh, doesn't have any children, so how would you like to be a second wife? How many of you would like to be Penina? Not, uh, you know. So I feel sorry for her. And can you blame her if she feels a little jealous that uh, here she's having all the kids and having to get up at night and, and take care of all the dirty diapers and all that. And then he's got another trophy wife over here that, uh, that uh, he really loves more than he loves her. And so whenever they go to, when he does go to the altar, then he gives this trophy wife more than, he, than she gets. Can you imagine how that, uh, what a mess that is? Now the Bible never uh, or the Bible in the Old Testament seldom does it talk about uh, uh, polygamy being wrong, but it sure shows you just how wrong it is. It, it, by implication, it just shows you. Uh, someone said um, that uh, bigamy is when a man makes the same mistake twice. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, there again, I mean, it's a it's a mess, and so it's a. And so here we have a, a guy who's made uh, some horrible mistakes. And uh, I don't, I mean, I, I, really after, now I don't want to get too deep into this and I don't want to say anything wrong because my wife, I got to go home with her. But uh, uh, I really like her sister. She's about a year and a half younger. But I cannot imagine those two living in the same house together. And if they did, I mean, even if her sister lived upstairs, I'm not sure that she and I would know. Well, you know what I mean. But anyway, I won't get into all that. But can you imagine? Now, when I say that, I like her sister. But, you know, I think her sister understands, too. She doesn't want to live with, with us either. So, you know, it's one of those things. But uh, there again, we're not getting into any other than, than that. You understand what I'm saying. But... Uh, uh, but just to be married to two people, just you can imagine how sad it was. Was and time and time again it would be. I got well, I like her, so I'll take the, I'll take your other your other daughter too. I mean, that is meeting the cultural norms of the day. So if they're the cultural norms of the day, why don't we do that here in our church today? It's one reason we're going to be showing the movie tonight. Uh, just to show you how that there are churches today that are now openly, not only getting into the immorality of it all, but now are openly accepting gay preachers and bringing their, and all that kind of stuff. And they're, it's being promoted by our seminaries. Can you imagine two men raising a child and that child being normal? You think there's going to be confusion in the land? I mean, we're talking about some of the big mega churches today, I think of one, I won't name it right now, some of you have been to it. But back in the 90s, whenever they really got started, they were, oh, we're not going, we're just going to preach on love. And we're not going to get into all the things. And it wasn't long before they were accepting the immorality on their staff. And it wasn't long before homosexuality was taken on their staff. Now they have paid positions of homosexuals on their staff. Do you know what that does to a church or to a family? I mean, folks, uh, 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 we don't have to get into all the different you know, LGBTQIA, well, all those different things. Uh, there's a Bible standard. And the Bible standard is one man, one woman, one marriage, till death do us part. Anything else that, from that is a breakdown of God's law and causes all kinds of problems. And I know from my own background and unfortunately in my own family, uh, just how severe that could be, especially with divorce involved and all those different things. And sometimes, you know, there are the innocent parties. We don't get in all that, but it sure causes all kinds of problems, doesn't it? But then at the same time, you know, we can just think about now that we accept that, then, then it just starts sliding downhill. And then we start accepting everything. And as, as we see in the book of Judges, every, there was no king in Israel and every man did what? What was right in his own eyes. It really doesn't matter what I think. I mean, it, it's what's in your heart that counts. I 
remember, uh, and I, I, like I said, I, I have not watched one full episode of, of any sitcom for years. I just, for some reason, I just don't like sitting down and watching sitcoms. But uh, I was in an office or, one, office or something one day, and I was watching Friends. And the reason I mentioned Friends, and some of now we got a generation that doesn't know who the, these people are, but uh, back in the 90s. And, uh, of course, Jennifer, or whatever her last name is, uh, was uh, the big girl or whatever. And she was uh, talking to a teenage girl who was thinking about going into immorality. And she, and she was saying, well, you know, it's when you, what's in your heart that counts? And she goes and all that. But you look at that movie or those, that whole social norms of that day, friends, and there were just a bunch of 20 something year old people, I think about well, six of them or whatever, and they all slept with one another. I mean, from what I understand, that's what the, the whole thing was set up with the relationships. And you say, well, why do you mention that? Because they did a recent study on that generation, and they said the number one show uh, that brought the most influence on the morality of uh, of that generation was the, it was the movie Friends. Now, folks, uh, I don't mind all the, us all having friends and all that kind of stuff, but there are differences, aren't there? We can't live like that. We can't expect God to bless a country that lives like that. And so here we see a lady who is brought into this stuff, and she has she is uh, she is a product of her society, unfortunately, and she's thrown into this situation. And how does she get out of it? And so we have a real problem. This lady is in a in a real situation where she has a husband that's not really following the Lord. She has a cultural, uh, she has all kinds of problems. Then we have Eli, the priests. And we see him sitting at the door and we know that his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were so wicked that God later on pronounced Ichabod over his family and over the nation of Israel. The glory has departed because of you, Eli. I mean, that's how wicked it had gotten. Oh, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, whenever women like this would come up or anybody else, they would, just, they would find a way to be immoral. And so they would do all kinds of things, it's stealing and, uh, from uh, people as well as just the immorality that was going on. And how horrible it was. And then we have uh, just the harsh environment of uh, the, that, uh, the, the great jealousy and there again, I can't blame Penina. Totally, can you? And so, you know, we make her the villain. Well, I don't know anybody. I mean, if I was Penina, I'd probably be worse than her. You know, so I'm just just knowing me. But uh, uh, there again, how sad this situation was that uh, Hannah lived it every year. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sure that she's probably glad her husband didn't go up every three times a year. Once was enough. But here she has to live day in and day out with this woman with kids running all around. And here she over, over here. And the, it was still the structure, even though they had left the morality behind, it was still the structure of Israel that you needed to have a lot of kids because you had farms and all that kind of stuff, and especially a man-child. And of course, any woman who had a child, well, maybe that was going to be the Messiah. So there was always something playing in on that. In fact, the, the tradition developed where if you had a male child, then you could have a, uh, after, the, after the child was, um, was old enough, or in, in fact, whenever you recovered enough, then they would have a month, they would have a month long baby shower for you. How would you like to have that, ladies? I mean, you come home and they'll take care of everything for the first month that your kid is alive. They bring all kinds of things over and you don't have to eat you don't, or, or you don't have to fix food or anything. But everybody is just there to help you take care of the kid, and especially family members and all that. Now, wouldn't that be great? Now, that's, a, that's what I call a, a good wedding, uh, unless you didn't like the people who did it. But, you know, other than that, it would be a big load off your... I think uh, Esther would like that this morning, don't you? But, uh, you know, those, th those type things. But if you were a... But if you had a daughter, then they might bring you a present, but it was like, you know, but there was... But they actually, they, didn't, they called it mourning, uh, M-O-U-R, in other words, crying. But uh, 
for two months, they would say, poor, poor Penina, she had a daughter. Wouldn't that be bad? I mean, talking about situations. So poor women that were, you know, you say, well, how? that's why God talked about there's never been a perfect society. And God built into men and women. Back when God said to Adam and Eve, he said to the woman, your desire will be for your husband. Now that word desire, and as you look at it and study it, it's not saying your desire is going to be just to take care and be a slave to your husband. It means that you're going to have a natural compunction to want to be equal, if not superior, to your husband. There's always going to be a conflict. So the, the battle of the sexes, that's always going to be there. And folks, it will be there until the day that the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Now, in our church, I'm always trying to figure out how do we as a church honor our ladies? And yet, uh, and then again, we know that God has placed men in position, and then they've done studies, women who become leaders in the church, the men will sit back and do nothing, just like Elkanah. And they start sliding back and not doing work. So that's the reason we're having a men's breakfast this coming Saturday to get the men involved because the women will come along and the women are excited and the women don't, you know, it's not right for the women not to drag their husbands along spiritually, is it? So there again, but there again, uh, you have this situation where the man becomes dominant and he's going to, and all that kind of stuff. Like here, Elkanah was a spiritual weakling and yet he's controlling two women. And so you have this back and forth all the way through the history of the, of, uh, of the world. And of course, that's why the ideal that Paul set up, husbands, love your wives, is Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I mean, that, that just honors women, that raises women up to a certain level. And then husband or wives be submit submit to your husbands. There again, but it says submit yourselves one to another before it says for the wives to submit. But there again, the whole idea there is just a range under. And when I got married, I had to submit to a lot of things. Not to most. I mean, when I say that, I didn't. My when I, you know, all of a sudden I realized that hey, I got to have a bigger house. I mean, I had a little 12 by 65 trailer and I thought that was be, going to be big enough. I needed three of them after I found out I got married. You know, so all those. And then when you have kids and all and all the rest, and I mean, you got to make sure that she has what she needs. And, you know, and I was talking to my son over in South Korea. He said, Dad, I came over here. I didn't worry about anything. Now he's married and he's trying to figure out how to get her back over here you know, and all this kind of stuff. I say, yes, yeah, a little bit different whenever you have a wife because you submitted yourself to marriage and you have promised that you would love and protect her. So that's the mission, isn't it? So how do you go back? And so every family, every couple has to work those things out. And so here we see that uh, poor old uh, Hannah is in a situation that uh, it's hard to work it out. And we see that, uh, how, how would you? How would you handle this? It'd be very difficult, wouldn't it? And so we see now that old Eli is the type of man he is and Eli had the power to bless. You notice he, he blessed her and prophesied that she would have a male child. And she took that from the word of God as the word of God. And she went and ate and was joyful that she was going to have a child. She took it as an answer of prayer. Now, if Eli had the power to bless, he also had the power to curse. What I mean by that, did Peter say, take up thy bed and walk? Did he not say that? Did he not have the power to bless? But also God gave him the power to curse. And did he, what did he say to, uh, to Ananias and Sapphira? So all these people today that have the power to heal and to prophesy and all these things, folks, if I see those same people and there's a few Ananias and Sapphira laying around, I might believe them. But since they are not, they're just, oh, God will bless you. You just come to my church and give to your money to me, whatever. Then God, something good is going to happen to you today. You're going to go to hell unless you get saved. You know, so all these things that we have seen, this, uh, this prosperity gospel and the corruption that we have seen and the loss of power in the church is because we're not preaching against sin and not holding up a standard of what goodness is. And so here we have Eli, the weakling, and yet he has to steal under the power of God because of his position as a priest. God had not pronounced Ichabod on him yet. 
And we see that uh, he blessed her, and we see that uh, she accepted his blessing and his position, even though he was a, a weakling with some very corrupt sons. So we see Hannah's prayer, and this is just, uh, uh, we did, uh, on, uh, on Wednesday nights, we're going through the uh, books of, or the book of Psalms, and we have now chapter, we went through chapters 46, 47, and 48, and I never had really seen that before, but uh, those Psalms have to deal with a great victory, and most, we think that it's probably the great victory that the children of Israel, or the, that Hezekiah and the, Jew, the people of Judah had over Sennacherib and the 185,000 people, if you know Bible history, uh, that died overnight uh, in the great deliverance. And those Psalms were set that I'd never seen that before until we really got into that. These, bless, these Psalms have been more of a blessing to me sometimes than I think they are to the people that, are, that, uh, that come on Wednesday night. But boy, they've been a real blessing. But uh, I never had seen that where those Psalms were set to music for women's voices. And they were Psalms for women to sing about the power of God and about what God has done in their lives. And here we see that, uh, that Hannah uses a term that they use repeatedly, or something that, that uh, a derivative of it. And we see that she is the first lady, or the first person in the Bible to use the term Lord of hosts. Now that is a term that, uh, that uh, Martin Luther uses, Lord Sabaoth, that's the uh, Jehovah Sabaoth, that's the Lord of hosts. And that term is used over 300 times after uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And it's about the God, the captain of the armies, the, the, the captain over the angelic host. He, I mean, he is, he is the all-powerful sovereign one. And he's the, he is the, uh, he's the Lord of creation. And he's the controller of the universe. And all these terms, and she uses this the first time. And we see that, uh, that back in, we see the word hosts that is used back in Genesis chapter 2 in the creation. And the Bible tells us, uh, thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And so God set up systems. God set up whole ways of things working. You think about the biological systems. You think about the botany systems and all the different things that God set up. And he's the, he's the host over them all. He can make the grain grow or he can make it wither. He can make the, the crickets grow or he, he can make them... Uh, he can be he can be under control. He can make the locust into a into a swarm, or he can make them just as simple grasshoppers. He can do whatever he wants to do. And she says, "Lord of hosts, the one who controls everything." We see this also uh, in Psalms as these ladies, Psalm forty six, twice they say, "The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge." Now, Jacob was a scoundrel himself, but, uh, you know, he had a couple of, of wives there. And uh, even though they were, it, was, it was, wasn't so much what Jacob was, it was who his God was, and that was the God, Jehovah. And so we see that uh, the Lord of hosts. Now, who is God with us? What does about who, about what's that name? He is Emmanuel. His name is, you know, of course, that's what, the, what Matthew chapter 1 says, his name it was Emmanuel, which is God with us. And so we see that, again, he's a sovereign over all the spiritual world. Remember back whenever the angels came and they told the shepherds to go to a certain place, and that's where they would find the babe wrapped in uh, swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then the Bible says, then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts. There is a whole system again. There's all kinds of ranks of, of angels and so forth. Millions of them, Revelation tells us. So again, we see the whole forces of nature. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that word resist, it means he marshals his forces against those who are proud. There again, the Lord of hosts. Uh, God doesn't, you know, it's just amazing. When you fight the Lord, it's like shooting biz, uh, BBs at the Bismarck. You're just not going to do much, you know. And so here we see that... Uh, uh, God is, she says, the Lord, of, Lord, you're the one who controls everything. 
It's interesting how those ladies picked right up on that uh, 300 years later in dealing with uh, Sennacherib and what he did there. And so we see that he is sovereign. He's a sovereign. That God is over everything. And the Lord Sabaoth is his name, as Martin Luther wrote. And Martin Luther wrote that, uh, that hymn after he had been kidnapped from, uh, by his own people to get him out from the influences of the government of that day. And he, they had to put him somewhere because, uh, the, because the church as well as uh, uh, other kingdoms around them were wanting to destroy him. And so he went to uh, one of the, the counts or the, to, the, uh, to a castle. And he was given free reign of that castle for a whole year. And that's when he translated the Bible into German language that is still being used today. But uh, he realized that he just couldn't stay there the rest of his life. And so at the end of that, he said, you know, if God can't take care of me, then no one can. And that's when he wrote the, the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, A Bulwark Never Failing. And he said, I'm coming out of the castle. God is my castle. And he lived to be an old man because God protected him. But in the middle of that, he talks about Satan or about the Lord. And he says, Lord Sabaoth. And he uses this term. The Lord of hosts is his name. He controls everything. And so here we see the that... Uh, that she's saying, oh, Lord of hosts, if you will do this, if you'll, and she, she really is seeking the Lord and notice with bitterness of spirit, well, she's pouring out her heart that there's passion there. And she doesn't know what else to do. And she's praying and seeking the Lord's face and how sad it is that old evil Eli had not seen any woman or anybody come and pray like that around the altar in years. And he thought she was drunk. Isn't that sad? Isn't it sad that people can pray and pour out their heart before God and people think they're drunk? How sad. This is a spiritual man who could give spiritual prophecies. God said, thus saith the Lord. And yet how blind he was to a common woman who came and prayed at the altar that he was there all the time. He was at the door of the altar. I mean, that was his position. He had gotten so used to the professionalism of uh, his position that he forgot the passion and the people that he served. How sad. And so that shows you the situation that Hannah is in. But, she has a, but she's just not depending on the priest. She's depending on the Lord. And as a result of that, Lord, the Lord heard her voice. Of course, we don't have time to go into in detail the rest of the story, but we know that, um, notice in verse 19, that early in the morning, uh, and, and they worship, they, they then uh, worship the Lord before the Lord and returned home to the house of Ramah, which was about 18 miles away from Shiloh. And Elkanah had no reason at all for distance not to fulfill his, uh, his time there. But uh, now Cana had uh, knew his wife, and uh, she and the Lord remembered her. Not others, but the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time. Of course, she conceived, and she bore the child named Samuel, which means "ask of God." And it says, "Because I've asked, uh, I've asked the Lord for him." And then notice now the man of Canaan knows how he's led by his wife. He didn't lead his wife. How sad. So the man of Canaan and all his house went up to offer a yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up. Why? Because she is going to concentrate three years of her life, at least three, maybe four. The weaning of a child uh, was about that long. Uh, by the time you got him potty trained and all the rest, it was about three to four years. And, uh, but she poured every spiritual influence she had into that child in four years. And she, uh, she taught him everything that she could. You, you say, well, uh, my, does that, you know, this, here's a biblical principle. Train up a child when he is young and when he is old, he will not depart from it. There again, Catholics tell us 
that if you give if you give me a child for until he's age six, he'll be a Catholic the rest of his life. Now, if that's true, what do you think the gay crowd is saying about your one and two year olds in kindergarten today? Does it make sense? So here we see the twig is bent. Here this child is given a, a, in the first formative years of his life before he goes to this, uh, to this nominal God, place, the altar. And yet we see that uh, within, by the time he's 12 years old and God is speaking to him, he's more spiritual than Eli is in how that God is using him. And how, so we see that Hannah kept her promise. And she gave him to the Lord. In verse 23, and so Elkanah and her, uh, and her husband, uh, excuse me, her husband said uh, to her, uh, do what seems best. <laughs> Notice he takes his hands off. And even though he had, uh, ladies, you have a weak husband, don't underestimate the power of a praying mother. As you see in the bulletin we put in there about Abraham Lincoln, he says, she still, you know, her, her thoughts still follow, have followed me all my life. And he was president when he said that. And so just what God can do, and by the way, his, wife, his mother died as, when he was very, very young. And yet he remembered that and the influence that she had in his life. And so we see that, uh, that now Hannah, uh, she weaned him. Notice in verse 26 of uh, 24, and she took him with her, with the bulls and the goats. And, and you would say, my, this would be so hard. No, we see that uh, they slaughtered a bull. And she said, oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my soul, I am a woman who stood before you, talking to Eli, praying for this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my, position, my uh, petition, which I have asked of him. Therefore, I have also lent him to the Lord, given him to the Lord. And as long as he lives, I love that. I like to pray to over children. And I like to pray uh, with, with parents. May this child serve the Lord as lo- all the days of his life or her life. And so notice they worshiped him. And Hannah prayed in this great prayer that she prayed sets a pattern for other, other uh, prayers in the Bible, especially the prayer of Mary and her Magnificent is so wrapped up in Hannah's prayer. Hannah had a tremendous influence over the women of Israel, let alone the men of Israel through her son. She was a woman who probably saved the nation because this nation was going down the tubes very quickly and it needed someone who could rectify it. And God had the godly woman who prepared a godly son to do the godly deed that he did. And so we see that God greatly blessed. I like it as you read this. And I just, uh, I think of my mother who died when I was young. Uh, I've still got a pair of socks in my sock drawer that my mother, I don't know, it was never, really never asked her to, but she just knitted them you know, or they, she mended them. And that back then, the pastels, remember those pastel socks and all that? Uh, well, uh, I, that was the only pair of them that I had, so she knitted them together and I've still got them. 50 years after she's died now. But it says, um, notice more of his mother in verse 39. Used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer a yearly sacrifice. Isn't that a great verse for a mother? She made little clothes. These days, most ladies would go and buy it at the store or whatever, but she made sure and she got them. My wife still, she, oh, doesn't this look good for one of our grandchildren? And she'll save it and all ready. And I, and I just had to say, I mean, at first it really frustrated me being a guy. But I thought, there again, the Lord said, wait a minute, that's the way women, women are. Let them enjoy it. And you know what? I've started enjoying letting her go and pick out a few things. Although I hate to mail them. I mean, boy, it's costing so much to mail them these days. I spent 50 bucks this past because she forgot to give stuff to Danielle and it cost me $50 to send it to her this week. But you know, but there again, it means something. Just to, isn't that, it, don't you love those little touches that the Bible puts 
in there about the about the nature of a woman and the and the gentleness and the goodness and of this godly woman and it never says she became you know they made a a a, a statue for her or they never really commemorated but they sure were blessed by her were and the women that were so influenced by her all the way up until the time of Mary and beyond who were influenced by this woman who just said, I'm going to take this impossible situation, I'm going to take it to the Lord and ask Him to bless. God is the God of the impossible, isn't He? Never underestimate the power of a praying woman and what God can do through those, man or woman, who will live for Him. Father, now we do thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the godly women of the Bible. Leah, who was such a persecuted woman, and yet she trusted you. And she wanted to see the Messiah come through you. We think of Ruth. What a great woman who sacrificed all and had no guarantee of anything but just loving the God of Israel and loving the woman who introduced her to him. We think of Hannah. We think of Esther. We think of Mary. And Lord, so many that have come after them. We think of Eunice and others, Lord, that are mentioned in the Bible that uh, are godly people that have made us who we are today. We thank you for them and the great legacy that we have had as a result of mothers and the great and inspiring influence that you've given through them. Oh, Father, we know the Messiah came through a woman. And we know, Lord, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, Lord, may people not be pointed to, to the woman, not to Mary, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you've done through them and for them and for us. Lord, bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.